Thank you for, thank you. Thank you for joining us for our seventh annual scholarship program and celebration of 13 years of serving our community. Yes, uh, of planning District 16. Welcome everyone. Before we begin our program, I would like to invite Jack Richards, the chaplain of the Rappahannock Regional Jail and founder of Christian Brothers and Sisters Transition Program to give the invocation. See how this works here. Can you hear me? Pardon? There we go. Okay, uh, I've met Juanita backstage and uh, she told me our table was voted again the coolest table in the room. <laughs> for, for the eighth consecutive year. Uh, but anyways, uh, for me there is no better feeling than asking assistance from God. Uh, and that's what an invocation is, asking for assistance. It sounds a lot better than help, don't it? Uh, I'm going to start using that uh, assistance a little more. And thank you, Juanita, for asking me to uh, open up in prayer. But uh, we're involved in the jail ministry, of Christian Brothers Transition Program, and I'm chaplain. So, we, so there's many various needs in the jail, jail ministry. Um, and I'm sure organizations rep, uh, represented here feel the same. There's so much need, and we need the network. We need assistance. Uh, if you lined up 10 returning citizens, they all have different material, physical, and spiritual needs. Throw in timelines, uh, their families, uh, everything. Who can meet those needs? Uh, we found out he can. So, but I'm a part of the uh, Christian Brothers and Transitions uh, program, and for the last 14 years, we have walked side by side with those released from Rappahannock Jail and area prisons, um, or anybody else who comes under our radar. Could have been in prison 10 years ago, it doesn't matter. Whoever comes under our radar, we will walk with you. Uh, God has shown us much in these years. We have much experience proven. Um, so does failsafe. We've, we've been right side by side with failsafe the whole time. God giving us assistance to assist others. Um, and some of the work we do is give words of wisdom. And we call them, we just made it up, we didn't know what to call them, but we call them truthisms. <laughs> and it's, it's what we learn from the returning citizens. Uh, you can put out a plan and hope somebody jumps in your plan. We found out to just observe, serve, show up, and the plan will come out, come out. I'll just give you a couple of them. I'm gonna give you three of them, one, one of our, our truthisms. And this is, again, what we have learned before our eyes and proven. Uh, give God one year. Uh, you know, that's, that's the patience, that's the waiting. Um, don't bold, you know, and it's a timeline. Somebody in jail or prison, they get out, they're expecting things to happen now. And it's pretty cool when they, they, they have a timeline, really? Okay, I'm gonna give God, keep your rights, rights, wrong, wrong, and carry on. Uh, another one is, of the three I'm gonna mention is, just show up. Somebody invite you somewhere, show up. We're not a phone ministry. You've got to come on our radar, you've got to show up somewhere. And this is what we tell them in jail or prison when they, before they get out or when they visit us first time. And lastly, don't worry, about your ride to work. Get the job first. Almost 100% of the time, the ride always follows. It, it, maybe you'll have to help them out one or two days, three days. A lot of times it's the first night of work. Hey, Jack or CBTP, you don't have to pick me up. I got a ride home. But the last lead before we get to the prayer is, uh, I can say that in this room here. We say it every Saturday morning. You don't know who's sitting next to you. You can work at the Pentagon. You can work, you can just get out 25 years of prison. Uh, and several people in this room know what I'm talking about. So like Abraham, God blesses through people. If we let him, Juanita has done that. 
Uh, Juanita is a good friend of mine. Uh, we have met me and her and a couple other people. Uh, we were doing it every other week or a week, I can't remember. And, you know, we really got to know each other. And they'll say wouldn't be here their own 13 years without God's assistance. Uh, God bless my friend Juanita and Failsafe. Uh, Failsafe exists because of her son Eugene. And um, you talk about something happening quick. Um, to go something bad happened to something good and flourish. Uh, when he passed away, it just, uh, something, something different happened. And um, the case manager, I told Juanita this for the second time, as recent as a couple of days ago, um, that the case manager told me in there uh, how special he was. And he wasn't, he was just telling me. He says, Jack, he cared for the other inmates and staff. He would say to the staff, hey, how you doing today? And really meant it. It was like he was the case manager. And he was a special guy. And uh, he touched, uh, touched people and uh, he seemed to care. So before I pray, I want to read a short part of a prayer from Moses. And this is what Moses prayer. I'm going to steal his prayer right here. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So may we bow in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we just uh, come before you today and ask you to, first of all, I guess, uh, bless the food, Lord, and uh, for the people who have made it and uh, made the food and uh, put, put the labor in, came in early this morning. Everybody who's shown up here who cares and has compassion, I pray for everyone in this room. I pray, pray for uh, Juanita and her family and the fail-safe volunteers who offer their time of service to uh, those uh, starting a new life. Uh, we pray, Lord, for more wisdom. Uh, every area we go in this ministry and uh, organizations like Failsafe is new territory. There is no uh, format to follow. It's uh, we just follow you, Lord. Uh, for Antoine, uh, the speaker, and Roy, Lord, we just pray that uh, you speak through them, that they touch each one of us with something they say, that we may benefit from it. And uh, Lord, we do pray for assistance. Um, we, we could never do it without you, and not by might, not by power, but by thy spirit. We wouldn't be able to do anything without your assistance. Uh, again, I pray for the food, and I thank you for this wonderful time that's going to happen today. In Jesus' name, amen. Wait, I'm not obedient. <laughs> thank you so much, Jack. 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 For those wonderful words. And Jack's right. You never know who you're sitting next to. We are all human beings. I will not point this person out, but there is someone in this room who just came home this morning. This morning. And you wouldn't be able to look at the person and tell, right? And that's how it should be in our community. I would like to take this time now to acknowledge some of our elected officials, our candidates for office, and also our sponsors. We have our Stafford County Board of Supervisors, uh, Supervisor Meg Bonke. Thank you so much for joining us today. And also agreeing to share some remarks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mrs. Marcy Catlett, did I see her come in? Marcy Catlett is the superintendent of Fredericksburg City Public Schools. If you're here and I've not seen you, I noticed you will sign up to come in. Thank you for joining us. Mr. Luke Wright, my fellow John Maxwell colleague. <laughs> Luke is also a retired Marine and he's candidate for State Senate District 27. Oh. Also joining us, for State Senate District 27 is a longtime friend of my son. He's known my son, they go back to middle school, I believe. Um, and, and, and as Jack mentioned, my son passed away last year. But Mr. Matt Strickland, Matt is also a veteran, and he's also the owner of Warmel's Restaurant. You have to check it out. You will hear from these two gentlemen. Thank you to our sponsors, Germana Community College, Fast Track Financial and Tax Services, 
Xavier Richardson and Mary Washington Healthcare, Restored Through Faith Ministries, Watchmen Ministries, Connor Real Estate, <laughs> Connor Real Estate out of Jackson, Mississippi, Orleans Bistro, Todd Rump, Karen Harris, and Rosa Harris. Thank you all. And thank you also to our vendors who are here. So we will take a, a short intermission. Please visit the vendors out in the lobby area. We also have our author, Antoine Carey, is here. He has his book. Many of you might not or might know his story, but he's another one, another success story walking around. He has a documentary, but you need to get the book to know the story, right? Yeah. I also have my book. I penned my memoir. So my book is also on the table out there. <laughs> For sale. <laughs> it's not for free. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Right, we can make it plain. Uh, but thank you all again for joining us. I also want to thank my family for supporting me. Uh, my husband, who is unable to be with us today, he's dealing with some medical challenges, so please keep him in your prayers. My daughter, Dr. Shaquilla Melchior. Has she come in the door yet? She's going to make a grand entrance, of course. And my granddaughter, my son's daughter, Inaya Melchior. Again, welcome. And now, if you would just join me in welcoming to the stage, Supervisor Meg Bunky, to share some opening remarks. I feel very honored to be up here. I remember when Juanita and I and a couple other folks went over to the jail. Gosh, Juanita, how many years ago was that? At least. No, it hasn't been that long. It's been a long time. Well, and Juanita said, I want to meet that jail superintendent. I said, all right, we're going to do that. And we went in there, and he sat like this back in his chair, and he wasn't very nice. Um, but then we talked about a program that he thought would be good for the jail. And he sat up in his chair and we got his attention. And Juanita kind of took it from there. Um, so I, I just have to thank you. Um, I feel like I haven't done enough for this organization. But I try to participate as I can with the uh, meetings that we have. We ran those meetings the whole time during COVID and, and we made progress. Um, but I'm really here to tell you today about something that's new. Um, I have been doing some research. I've been to Fairfax County twice, and I was there this past Thursday from 10 to 3. And part of our tour was at the uh, adult juvenile, no, adult detention center. And while there, I got to witness a program called STAR. Has anybody heard of it? Okay, um, it's a great program. And I'm gonna tell you what I saw there and how I'm gonna take action to try to bring this to Stafford County and to Planning District 16. Because as you know, our jail is a combination of everybody in Planning District 16. So STAR stands for Striving to Achieve Success. So the sheriff, Stacy Kincaid, started this program, but actually got the idea from Chesterfield County. Many times, Chesterfield, they're brilliant. They create a lot of their own uh, programs, but this one they actually uh, received from Chesterfield. And it's all for those that are addicted to drugs and have uh, substance abuse issues. There were 15 people when we walked in the room, and we were allowed to talk to them, ask questions. Uh, it was kind of a very informal format. And they each stood up, those that wanted to, and told us their story. And I'm just gonna tell you, I had tears in my eyes and I was so impressed. And if I can just tell you a few comments that were made in that room. A 60 year old man said, I have been in and out of incarceration for so many years 
and I finally feel for the first time in my life that I'm gonna have a life when I get out of here. And he said, and it's this program because they make us accountable. And we have to compete and um, apply to be in this program. You're not automatically in it. And so um, the facilitator was there as well. They encourage each other. Two gentlemen got up and spoke and I asked them, have they taught you public speaking because you've done a phenomenal job? Um, and they said, no, but anyway, and there were smiles on their faces. They didn't look sad. They're in this little section of the detention center all by themselves. They don't interact with the other inmates and they are all part of a big family. They all said, I've been through other programs, but I've never been through anything like this that has um, really educated them about their brain and what things happen to your brain when you do drugs and alcohol and why they may have made these poor decisions. They said they stand up there and they ball their eyes out in front of their peers that are in this group. And it breaks their whole body down so that they can come out of this and be kind of healed. And they said they know more about themselves at all their different ages than they've ever known about themselves as individuals. So with that being said, I have already asked the chairman of our board, Crystal Benuch, because on our, in our bylaws in Stafford County, as an elected official, you can add an item to the Board of Supervisors for discussion, okay? I already sent an email yesterday to the chairman, the clerk of the board, and our county administrator indicating I would like this on our September 20th meeting agenda under discussion. So that's the first step. The next step is if the board, you know, I only operate as one board member. You gotta count to four when you're on the board. You gotta get four votes for everything. Um, then the board will make a decision, which I can't imagine why they would say, we don't wanna, re we wanna research this. We wanna gather some data from Chesterfield and from Fairfax, um, you know, look at the recidivism rate. How did these people get here? There's so much research, as you all know. And then, what is it gonna cost? How long will it take to implement this? Can we do this in our jail with the way it's currently set up, the structure itself? Um, what additional resources, et cetera? So, I just wanna share that with you. Um, and I, uh, if you would like to come to the September 20th meeting, you're always welcome as a, as a public official, as a, a, a constituent. Whether you're in the county or not, you can come and speak. You get three minutes to speak. We have a three o'clock and a seven o'clock meeting. Um, so, or if you just wanna email somebody and say, wow, I think this is a great idea. You can Google this program in Fairfax or Chesterfield and learn a little bit more about it. But I think it's something that we need here in Planning District 16. So that's what I wanted to share today. And um, thank you very much for giving me the honor to come up here and, and talk with you. And uh, if you would like my business card to reach out to me on other things that we could be doing in the community, uh, in addition to what Failsafe is already doing, uh, please reach out. The last thing I wanna share is that Juanita, this past year, we actually funded Failsafe as one of our partner agencies. So if I remember, Failsafe had applied in prior years and they were not funded. And I said, Juanita, you gotta go meet with Donna Krause in our office. She'll tell you what you need to do and how to figure out how you get funding. So that was great success yes. to you, Juanita. Thank you. So thank you very much. And I'm so thrilled that I was able to be here today. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Meg. Isn't she awesome? Yes. We need more leaders like Meg Bonkey. Did you get that on the video? Yes. Awesome. <laughs>
But no, thank you so much for your great leadership and your support. And it is because of great leaders like you, uh, Meg, that we are better equipped to do the work that we need to be able to do in the community. And the work that we do in Fell Safe Area is not possible without all of you. So thank you all so very much. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the great Fell Safe Era team that makes it all possible. Please stand. We have several that are missing, but please stand if you are a team member of Fell Safe Era, if you are a volunteer, a staff, a see board member, if our board members are here, please stand. Thank you so much. Thank you for your hard work and your commitment to helping others succeed in our community. At Fell Safe, we provide informative strategies to empower and restore hope to families and individuals that have been impacted by incarceration through our right road reentry and caring connections to prevent generations of incarceration. Our core purpose is to foster positive change in the lives of individuals and families that have been affected by, affected by incarceration. Uh, justice involved individuals not only have difficulty finding employment, but when they do, they oftentimes experience reduced wages. They face difficult housing issues. We know housing is a big, big problem. I see my fellow Marshall Williams back there shaking his head. Marshall Williams is one of our partners. He's with Virginia Cares and People Incorporated doing the same thing we're doing, providing support and services to the returning citizens. Thank you, Marshall. Right. It takes a village. <laughs> But they also deal with behavioral challenges within their families and within themselves. And so what we focus on and fail safe is we have to work on, our goal is like, how do we change their thought process? How do we change their behaviors? When you were talking, Meg, about brain health, that's another area that we're focusing greatly on. Many people don't pay attention to the brain, the mind, because if you don't see it, right? It's not like your arm is broken, you see it, you can fix it. But many times, those guys, these guys and girls have been impacted by some form of trauma. And until we address that trauma, can we help save that person or that individual? But they, returning citizens face multiple challenges and hardships. And that makes, unfortunately, social integration back into our communities pretty difficult. But we're here to help them do that. We're here to be that bridge to help them across into the community. But let me share with you that I mentioned earlier, there are some success stories. There are some success stories in the room. We have some success stories in Bell Safe Air. Marshall has some success stories. But let me tell you about one in particular who's here in the room with us. His testimony as our first year scholarship recipient. Every year we give a scholarship to a returning citizen and a family member. But this person here, um, he was our first year scholarship recipient, uh, recipient. Let me give you a little background information before I have him come up to share his testimony. After being released from the Department of Corrections in December 20, 2008, at the age of 45, still with only a high school diploma, he embarked on a journey that would forever change his life and give purpose to his past. He enrolled in Germana Community College. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. <laughs> he enrolled in Germana Community College in 2009 and completed his associate degree in psychology in 2010. While in the middle of his associate's degree, he enrolled in Old Dominion University and completed his bachelor's degree in human services in 2012. He enrolled back in Old Dominion University's graduate school and completed his master's degree in mental health counseling in 25. He is currently a contractor at pro and project manager of a high profile security service in the Washington DC area. As a matter of fact, he's gonna have to run out of here shortly <laughs> after he presents <laughs> to continue that work. Um, but through his education and personal life journey, his goals are to serve God in a mighty way that helps returning citizens change their lives by changing their negative beliefs and to help them realize that they are significantly valuable in the eyes of God and that it is never too late. And that's the truth. 
It's never too late in life to become what you could have become. He is now a licensed professional counselor. Yes. He and his wife are now the proud owners of Mental Health Solutions of Virginia. His approach to counseling is biblical, biblical, and evidence-based. He has done extensive work in cognitive behavioral therapy and behavior modification with children, teens, and adults, and families. He believes in the authority of scripture, the work of the Holy Spirit, in healing, and is committed to helping individuals mature in Christ through the process of mental health therapy. Please join me in welcoming our first year scholarship recipient, who's now a licensed professional counselor, Mr. Roy Brinkley. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, to prove I'm a member of Failsafe, I got a business card. <laughs> also to prove I'm a member of Christian Brothers Transitional Program, my very first business card. In 20, 2009, I believe, thanks to Jack Richards. Y'all look good. I'm gonna see if I can take a selfie. <laughs> I probably wouldn't be able to do it. Um, I wanna thank you, Juanita, for this opportunity. But first, I must give glory and thanks to God. Thank you. I'm a little nervous, like I was. I was the first scholarship recipient in 2015, and I'm so thankful and grateful and honored to be able to come back here and share my testimony and my story. Uh, I also want to thank you, Jack, for that opening prayer and remarks, because I can feel the Holy Spirit's presence yeah. when you did that. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. So, for clarification, this is considered to be the second chance day. Now, I know if y'all thinking the same thing I'm thinking, this is not Roy's second chance, right? But, so I had to go to God with that to find out exactly what that meant because I mean, I know I need a few zeros behind that because I was incarcerated in and out of incarceration for about 25 years. Um, I was addicted to crack cocaine. And so for many, many years, oh, I see my spiritual mentor, Teresa Houghton right there. Thank you. I want to recognize Teresa Houghton right now. She's an ordained minister. Um, please raise your hand. You'll hear more about her shortly. Um, so what does second chance really mean? So because I know I'm not on my second chance, it's been about probably about 25, 30 years since I've been on my second chance. I had to ask God because I didn't want to stand up here and act like I was on my second chance. But what God told me was it means it's not about the number. It's about another chance. It's about the fact he woke me up today. He woke you up today. And the person in this room who came home from incarceration today, congratulations. Congratulations. It is my hope and my prayer for you that you come out running. And here's my reason why. So when we was incarcerated, we were sitting down, watching television. Food was brought to us. They did our laundry and all of that. You get my point. So when we get released from incarceration, the last thing we need to be doing is taking our time. Now I know Jack talked about giving the Lord a year. I give God all the time because I give him all the glory. See, I ain't even supposed to be standing here today. Before I begin that, today, for the very first time, somebody will pick up some drugs. Today, somebody will die from an overdose. It's just a fact. Today, somebody will not know that today is an opportunity where God has given them another chance. So I wanna ask if we can just take a moment of silence for about 10 seconds for the sick and suffering addict 
who today will lose their life, who today will pick up and use drugs and not understand the devastation behind it. Can we take 10 seconds, please? Thank you. So I told people on March 3rd, 2008, when I was here before, six o'clock in the morning, I was out looking for drugs. I was stopped, I was arrested, like so many other times. But this is the mirror. I was placed in the back of a police car. And some of you might not believe this, that's okay. When I was in the back of the police car, this is what I heard. It is over. And I heard it again. It is over. Now I knew exactly at that time who it was. And the reason I knew, now I didn't hear it the way you hear my voice. I want to make that clear. It was a feeling I was able to interpret the meaning and the understanding, but most importantly, who it was. Most important, instantly, and from that moment on, 2008, six o'clock in the morning, I ain't never wanted to smoke crack again. Instantly. And that was the day of my deliverance. That was the day of the miracle. I want to share a scripture with you guys that um, I learned and came across when I was in jail. Because I spent 25 years struggling and suffering. I didn't believe I was worthy. And some days I still struggle with that. I don't believe sometimes that I deserve all the blessings that I have. The good news is I don't have the final say. And nobody else else does either. Only God. But when I was incarcerated, God gave me this scripture among many. Hebrews 8, 12. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. When I knew I was forgiven, I knew I had another chance and another opportunity. Thus, the second chance. Get love. Amen. Um, I'm going to show you guys a picture or something, and I want to warn you, this picture is a very horrible picture, but I want to set the stage from what I used to, from who I used to be. That was me, as you can see, I got lumps all over my face and all kinds of stuff. I'm probably about 150 pounds. I'm at, I'm incarcerated at DOC, but the blessing of this is this. Every single day of that incarceration, you can take that. <laughs> the interesting thing about that is, when I came home from incarceration, I kept that ID in my pocket. For five years, I took it everywhere I went. If I just went to 7-Eleven, I had that picture with me. And the reason why I had that picture with me, because it was a constant reminder. It reminded me of where I didn't want to go back to. So I kept it in my wallet everywhere I went for at least the very first five years. All my previous incarcerations, uh, I think Juanita or someone talked about this, people were not changing their mindset. We trained our bodies like we was gladiators. You know, we would be in there lifting weights, push-ups, sit-ups, and everything. The difference in this incarceration this time, it was a mind shift. I trained my mind along with exercising and training my body. But I began to understand if I could get my mind up, I can get my body up. When I got my mind out, I got my wife back. I got my wife out. And this is my wife, uh, Nancy. I don't know how she did it, why she did it, but I sure am thankful. That she did it. When I started this journey, I had no idea that just because I stopped using drugs, that I would still have problems. I thought that all my problems was all drug related. 
But how many of you know that just because you was a drug addict doesn't mean you won't have no more problems? See, there's people in this room who ain't never been a drug addict, but they got the same kind of problems as anybody else, okay? So I don't hide behind the excuse or the statement that just because I was a drug addict, that woe is me. I deserve to have a sit on the pig pot. And if you got a friend like Deb Lowcranks, you ain't got the opportunity. Hey, Deb. Sorry about that. So soon I would discover, I would soon discover though that God would take my mess and he would turn it into my message. Okay. And I want to say that one more time. Only God can take somebody's test and turn it into a testimony. Take somebody's trials and turn it into a trial. Take a victim and make them victorious. Okay. Uh, second picture. When I came home from incarceration, it was important for me not only to get my mind together, but to get my body together. The freelance star did a picture or did a, uh, a story on me because I hadn't seen a doctor in about 20 years. I was busy running the streets. I was busy smoking crack. I was busy in and out of jail. Hadn't seen a doctor in 20 years. But at this time, I knew I had to get everything together, not just my mind, but also my body. Yeah. You can leave that one up. <laughs> So, uh, Sue Park is not here today, huh? I wanted to recognize Sue Park. When I came home from incarceration, Sue Park was one of the very first people who connected, with, connected me with several people who are in this room. She's the one who introduced me to the organization that, introduced, that funded me to go to Germana. Now, I got the money, I registered at Germana, my very first year, this is when I met this incredible woman right here named Dr. Wolf. She's the first LPC, licensed clinician that I ever knew. She's also, she was also my first instructor, professor, and also a mentor. I used to come to her office and cry about everything. So she's, <laughs> and, but she was a therapist, so she's a counselor, so she can listen to me. <laughs> but I wanna tell you guys, this journey right here almost never happened. And here's why. My wife and I were at Myrtle Beach about a week before school was getting ready to start my very first semester. Now, I hadn't been in college since I flunked out of college back in the 80s, to be honest with you. So I didn't have any college credit. So I had to start all over. But we're at Myrtle Beach. My phone rings, and it's Germana. It's the register, register's office. They tell me. All my classes have been dropped. The funding was pulled. Now this is what's so interesting. I was standing on faith. I was like, I trusted God. I knew God had ordered my steps. So how could this have happened? I was confused, I was devastated. In the past, that would have been my excuse to go back to smoke crack, to give up. I almost did, I wanted to. I didn't know what to do. I looked at my wife. She wasn't my wife at the time. She did agree at the time already to be my wife. We was engaged. I looked at my wife and asked her, I had to humble myself and asked her if I could borrow the money. So it took a lot out of me in order for me to do that. And I want to let you guys know, I was so desperate. I was willing to do anything it took because I knew that God had ordered this process for me. And you'll be able to find out and understand exactly what I'm talking about because in this whole entire time that I was going through all of this, God was there each and every step of the way. I suffered a whole lot of days and nights, but guess what came in the morning? Anybody know? Amen, amen. Joy came in the morning. And God was putting people in my path, like Dr. Wolf. So then I came home from incarceration and I got my very first job. Teresa Hope, 
was my director, an ordained minister. She poured into me in such an incredible way. And I don't want nobody to be confused. This woman of God showed me how to walk in ministry, in faith. She showed me how to become a man of God, this woman. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. God used a lot of people. Uh, Sue Parr, hope most of y'all know who she is, right? Jack Richards, Christian Brothers Transitional Program. My very first, I got released on a Friday. I was at Jack's program on Saturday morning. Jerry D. Pasquale picked me up and brought me to, to the many, first meeting. Dr. Wolf, let me tell you what she did. I wrote my very first paper. She told me to stay after class. <laughs> so keep in mind, when I was in college during the 80s, there weren't no computers. We, you know, we did book reports. We didn't do research papers. At least I didn't. I don't know about anybody else. So this is what she told me, though. She said, Roy, if you want to go any further, you're going to have to learn how to write. You're going to have to learn how to do this, that, and the other thing. And when Dr. Wood tells you something, you can count it. You can believe it. So I had to humble myself. Now, this is at my associate degree level. Who was even back the associate's degree? I was the only seeking to get a paraprofessional certification, which is similar to an associate's degree, but it wasn't an associate's degree. But because of her and her program, her wisdom, her vision, she set me on an educational path. The reason why I graduated with all these degrees, I would have never been able to make it if it hadn't been for Dr. Wolf. Give Dr. Wolf a hand, please. Thank you. And I mentioned Teresa Holden, my mentor. Deb Lowbrinks, wow. Deb is the best friend anybody could ever have. She won't let you cry. She won't let you get on your pity pie. Deb helped me understand that all the times I was down on myself because I wouldn't do the things today that I wouldn't, that I did before, she helped me understand that I was convicting an innocent man. Thank you, Deb. Juanita Shanks, I don't even have to tell you. I got the business card of food. <laughs> What's so amazing about fail safe in the organization, it helped, it made me a comic. And it also helped me feel part of a family along with Christian Brothers Transitional Program. So when I was running into problems and things like that in the community, my decision making was based on how would they feel. They prayed for you, they supported you, they bended for you. So every decision, it was, I didn't have some really tough times where the old person would have been back incarcerated. But because I cared about how they would feel, Dr. Wood, Teresa Houghton, Jack Richard, Juanita, Deb, I don't want to let you down. I'm not standing here today because I'm some superstar. No. I'm standing here because of people like them. I don't stand on their shoulders. I don't stand on their shoulders. In fact, I should be down on my knees washing their feet. Because I am the lowest, most humblest person. Now, I don't think I'm saying something negative about myself. That's just because I owe. I know that I owe. Uh, more people, uh, Marshall Williams, you heard his name. This brother showed me what a soldier in the Army of Christ was all about. When I applied to the board to get licensed, because of my background, I had, if you fill out applications, you know the drop down boxes, right? 
So I had to go through all of that. I had to apply and get all the documentation and things of that nature. And they wanted proof that I completed my probation. I didn't have access to any of that information. I got a phone call from Marshall Williams saying, I got you, brother. He took care of that for me. I submitted those documents to the board, and I was accepted to the board because of my forgiveness. Thank you. And there's another person here who is a prayer warrior. I want to give her recognition, and that's Sister Geneva. Where's she at? Sister Geneva and I used to do jail ministry together. When I'm struggling emotionally and spiritually, I can call that lady and she will pray. And God absolutely hears her prayers. Thank you. Um, next picture, number four. So what this is right here, guys, during my internship, this is a letter from Old Dominion University. I was sitting at home on a Sunday evening watching television and I get an email. They kicked me out of school. After, this is in my graduate year. I done went through my associate, my bachelor's. Now I'm in my master's program and I get an email and they're telling me that I'm kicked out because of my background check. This was the second test. Now, I didn't know what to do. A hundred and something thousand dollars later, you mean to tell me, God, you said in your word that you would never leave me or forsake me. And I know you ordered these steps. So what am I going to do now? I can't even complete my graduate degree. So I prayed and for a whole week. I took a shower probably about twice. This is how devastated I was. I was floored, guys. I couldn't leave the house. I was scared on what would happen, what I would do, what I use, would I go back to being the old guy. So to make a long story short, I stayed in prayer, in prayer. Gave them all kinds of responses about what had happened and things of that nature. But here go God again. All those charges that I have, God would show up, and I only had one charge that was considered a barrier crime. And that had a five year duration. So it was six to seven years later. So they had to reinstate me. <laughs> Picture number five. Uh, oh. So check this out. This is, um, I get my, one of my first background checks done by Behavioral Health. Uh, and they say, if you can see right there, San Jose, California, in 2001. I've never been there. In fact, in 2001, I didn't have enough change to catch a bus. How does this happen? So this, again, is one of my many trials. And I didn't get the job, but Nevertheless, I never gave up on God. I knew God was going to show me a way. And I want you all to understand something. Everything I'm saying, everything I'm doing to this day is to glorify and to magnify the name of the Lord. Okay? Picture number six. This is the next one when they got it right. I'm now eligible, but this is a year later. This is a year later. Picture number seven. Oh, I had to show this. I would be remiss. Deb Lowcrank was also my boss. And this is my offer letter. Uh, I kept that for sentimental reasons, just like I kept these cards right here. This is a business card from 2008 that long ago. Jack was surprised when I showed it to him today. Thank you. So, fast forwarding guys, and I'm going to wrap it up here shortly. When I first took the board exam, I failed. The, my car was like from here to the parking lot. 
That was the longest walk of my life. I was embarrassed, I was devastated. About a week or two later, I was on the phone with Deb, and I told Deb, I failed. This is what she said. Oh, let's take it again. I said, what? Yeah, just take it again. And, move, so, and she moved out with the conversation. That was all there was. Well, I'll tell you, that's why she is such a good friend. So I gave up the pity pot. I got up every morning at four, five o'clock. I studied for months, seven days a week. Because I didn't want to face the other kid either. <laughs> In fact, halfway through that exam, I knew I was going to pass. I ain't going to tell you why, but I just took God. I, had, I knew I could feel God's Holy Spirit. I knew I was going to pass. I don't know if Teresa remembers when we had a speaker came and told us about the importance of attitude. For those who don't know, if you take the word attitude, under each letter represents a number, like A is one, for example, and you add that up, it equals 100. The word attitude equals 100. I learned there that the word attitude or your attitude determines altitude. See, it's easy to praise God when my bills was paid. It's easy to praise God when my relationship with my wife was going well, work is going well, the kids ain't acting up. But what about when nothing goes your way? What about then? So all these trials and all these tribulations that I was going through, the one thing I never did was give up. Never, ever give up. And to the one who came home from incarceration today, please stop running. First, run after God. Let God order your steps. Okay? There ain't no time for no breaks, no days off. We had that when we were sitting down every single day for however long we was incarcerated. The expectations for a man or woman coming home from incarceration should not be low. In fact, I believe they should be higher. Expecting, I, don't get me wrong, I know people mean well when you want to pat them on the back and tell them it's going to be okay. It ain't okay. It ain't okay. We got to get moving. We owe. And I'm fortunate to have people on my team, and that's what I call my team, who, when I need help, they have always been there. I'm a person who, who believes that if I believe it, then I can achieve it. It wasn't about I need to see it first and then I might believe it. No, it was a long shot. It was a risk. I didn't know if I was going to be able to be successful, but God knew. God knew, and I trusted God. The entire, just like I trust him today. God has opened up so many doors for me that's unbelievable. Juanita shared just a little while ago, I'm leaving here shortly because I have a security detail. Me. I'm the guy that they used to stop a, a half mile away. Believe it or not. My client today is Jennifer Lewis. She was the mother of Anthony Anderson on Blackish. Next week, Viola Davis. Now, make no mistake about this, I'm not bragging. I'm testifying to the goodness of God, okay? I'm testifying. God will make a way, ain't nothing impossible with God. People told me I wasn't smart enough. They said, nobody's gonna hire you. What makes you think you got what it takes? Crackhead. I hired him. Thank you. 
Thank you. <laughs> so I want to share what my definition kind of is, uh, what faith is. And this is what I wrote down. The assurance that things revealed and promised in the word are true. Every word. Even though they are unseen. This gave me the conviction to believe that what I can expect through faith will come to pass. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen? So I got up every single day for about four years and told myself, Dr. Wolf, that I was an LPC, a licensed professional counselor, way before I was a licensed professional counselor. People thought I was probably talking to myself. Riding my bicycle, exercising. I'm an LPC. I'm an LPC. I'm an LPC. I would have never given up. But I'm so thankful today to be able to stand before you and give God praise and give him glory. And I'm going to say to the person, who, uh, lastly, who came home from incarceration, you must take the risk. If you do not take the risk, you can never grow. If you cannot grow, you can never become your best. If you cannot become your best, you can never be happy. And if you can't be happy, what else is there? <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. And y'all know I don't stand, I don't deserve no standing with you. God bless you and every one of you. Wow. Truly amazing, right? Now, can you really look at this man and tell he's a returning citizen? You seen it. You seen it. Can you really, can you look at this person and tell they are returning? You don't know. We do not know. Thank you so much, Roy. Roy is now one of our partners. Isn't that awesome? And as you heard from him, it takes a village. And it does. Every last one of you in this room, you're part of that village to help our returning citizens. We're gonna take some time now. Looks like our food's here. Jack's already dressed the food, so we need to get ready to eat. <laughs>